you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to be reading from uh, the book of Genesis. We've been going through a study in the, uh, in the book of Genesis for some time. And I uh, so want to remind everybody, all the messages are on our website. If you go to the website and go where it says videos, and, uh, and we, have like a, we, have, we have most of the messages on MP3 format there. So um, tonight we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 32. And uh, if you could cut the volume down just a little bit because that ringing is there. Okay. I'll try to talk loud. But... Uh, Kind of knock that ringing out. Okay. Um, we're reading about Jacob, and these last few few weeks we've been we've been reading the stories about Jacob, and this is this will really kind of <coughs> uh, close the stories that are focusing on Jacob. From this point on, they'll be focusing more on his kids, on his children. Um, but these last couple chapters and these last couple uh, narratives dealt with. Jacob's journey, and we've been saying it's a journey from being a con man to a prince of God. And what it took for Jacob to get to the place that we're going to read about tonight. We all know, uh, just recapping just a little bit, how Jacob uh, had to run from his brother Esau. His brother Esau swore to kill him because Jacob connived the blessing off of his dad that should have been Esau's. And we know that earlier Jacob, sold, or, uh, Jacob bought the birthright from Esau. Uh, for a bowl of soup. So Jacob had pretty much put himself in the position in the driver's seat, and God had told his mother that when they were, the twins were struggling in the womb, he said that uh, the younger would, uh, or the, uh, the elder would serve the younger. It was already uh, predetermined. And uh, Jacob had to flee from his brother Esau because his brother Esau swore to kill him. He ended up going toward his uncle's place, in a place called Haran, and on the way he had a dream, uh, and the dream, of course, was we call it Jacob's ladder, but it was really like a staircase where he saw angels ascending and descending, and he saw God at the top of the staircase in his dream. And uh, God told him, He promised him, He gave him the Abrahamic blessing and, and the covenant. He said, "You will be the one through whom all the promises would be fulfilled, uh, the promises that He made to Abraham. He would have the land, and He would have." His seed would bless the earth and bless all peoples of the earth and would be like the sand on the seashore and so forth. Uh, so Jacob went. We know he went to see his uncle Laban and he fell in love with Laban's daughter named Rachel. Uh, he ended up uh, working seven years for Rachel, got uh, the old switcheroo pulled on him, ended up with Leah, and, uh, and then worked another seven years for Rachel, ended up with two wives, who each had a maidservant. They ended up with 11 children, or 11 sons, up until this point. Later, the, the, the youngest son, Benjamin, would have been born later. But uh, he had 11 sons, one daughter. He had amassed a, a, a great wealth of animals. That uh, Again, the story that we went through, how he uh, took the, the sheep and so forth and were able to breed them to a place where he got all the speckled and spotted and sheep. And we, you can read the, listen to the messages about all that. But he amassed a, a great, uh, a lot of wealth, and he had this big family. And he uh, decided to flee from Laban, to leave that place and go back to his homeland. And last week we talked about uh, Laban pursuing him and how God protected him and so forth. Uh, so tonight we jump in on chapter 32. He's left Laban. Uh, he's amassed all these wealth and goods, and he has wives and kids. And he's uh, sort of in between jobs, as it were. He's leaving one and he's going to another. He's leaving the place that I like to think of as a place of probation because it was during that time with Laban that a lot of the stuff that he did, got, he got done to him. Okay, how many know we talk about that? That, you know, if you, what goes around comes around. That's not necessarily in the Bible, but it is. God, God makes sure that the people that he's going to use as his servants are going to have to face and come, come face to face with their stuff, with their sin, with their baggage. And that's for 20 years of Lab uh, Jacob working for, with Laban, working for Laban. He had to come face to face with who he was. Okay. So he's on his way back home. And we read in verse 31, uh, uh, chapter 32 and verse 1. 
And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. Now remember, 20 years ago, as he was traveling to Haran, he saw the angels in a dream. But now, as he's on his way back, the angels appear to him in person. And it says, and when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. And he called the name of the place Mahanaim, which means two camps or two hosts. Now when he was going to Laban's house, he there was a place called Bethel, which was the house of God. Now on the way back, he's at the camp of God. In verse 3. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau. You see, he's, he's kind of going from the frying pan into the fire because he's leaving one really bad situation with Laban. He's running from Laban, and he's going back to the place where the guy that he ran from originally is waiting for him. And as far as Jacob knew, Esau was ready to kill him. Because the last thing he had heard about Esau was that he had marked him. Esau was going to get his pound of flesh because Jacob had ripped him off. So as far as he knew, now we know the end of the story. We, we've read the story. But Jacob didn't know the end of the story. He just knew there was a God that spoke to him, that sent his angels, a God that promised him that he would have that land, a God that promised him that he would have a great posterity. So he's on his way back, and he sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, in verse 4, saying, Thus shall you speak unto my lord Esau. This, thy servant Jacob says this, I have sojourned with Laban and have stayed there until now. Now, now. now listen to his language. Remember, God told Jacob that his older brother would serve him. But now he's calling himself thy servant. Tell my Lord Esau. Jacob is, is like humbling himself before Esau because he knows what Esau is about. He says, I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find grace in thy sight. He called Esau his Lord. Now, he didn't realize this, but he didn't have to do that. In fact, the stuff we're going to read right now, we're going to realize he didn't have to do any of it. Because God had it already taken care of. Did you ever fight a battle before it happened? Well, you, know, you know what it's like to load up for bear, right? You know, you get ready for that. And you load up and, and it doesn't happen. Well, Jacob, he's, I mean, he, as far as his life is on the line. And in fact, if you read on a little bit more, it says, when the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he comes to meet you with 400 men with him. Jacob said, Uh-oh. He's bringing an army. And these men who were with Esau, they were men because Esau was a man's man. You know, so this wasn't... So Jacob figured, Wow, this is it. This is it. God spoke to him. Uh, you know, the angel appeared to him. He had the dream. But still, say, I mean, you might have all the faith in the world, but there's just some things that's just scary. He was scared. And I don't blame him. Because he ripped his brother off. He conned his dad. Okay, so he, I mean, in his eyes, Esau had every right to be angry with him. This did not sound good to Jacob. He was not thrilled to hear that uh, he was coming with 400 men. So it says in verse 7, Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that was with him and the flocks and herds and the camels into two bands, and said, If Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. He was making plans for a bloodbath. He said, If I split my stuff up and they see what's going on over here, the other, at least the other half will be able to, to flee. He's preparing, he's preparing himself for the worst. And he, did, he, he does what I think all of us, when we get in those places, I hope that this is the first place we turn. Because he realized his brother was coming to kill him in his mind. And he prayed. And Jacob said in verse 9, Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which said to me, Return unto your country and to your kindred, and I will deal with thee. He opened up his prayer by reminding God of his promise to him. Do you know there's nothing wrong with reminding God about his promises? You're not being arrogant. 
uh, and it's not like we're demanding of him, but if God said something, we need to stand on his word. He says in verse 10, I'm not worthy of the least of all your mercies, and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. He acknowledges his sinfulness. He acknowledges his need. This isn't the same Jacob that, that left home and went to Laban's house. He's a different man. Twenty years with Uncle Laban changed Jacob. Not only 20 years with Uncle Laban, but 20 years with two wives that kept fighting with each other. 20 years with 11 kids that couldn't get along with one another. 20 years with, you know, uh, with, with uh, Laban's sons who kept accusing him of stealing and all these other things. 20, it, it, Jacob was not the same guy that left the promised land on his way back. He's a different person. God allowed all those things. We might say, God, why did you let Jacob go through all this stuff? He allowed all those things to happen to him to make him a different person. He's just like one step away from princehood. He got one more step to go. He acknowledged his sinfulness. In verse 11, he says, Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother. He prayed for deliverance. God, we need to learn how to pray. Listen, when you're up against something, we need to pray, God, deliver me. Have you ever been in a place where you said, God, save me? Now, I'm not talking about salvation to go to heaven. That's, that's you know, the salvation experience. But there's sometimes we get into situations and in, in, in circumstances we just need to say, God, help. What am I going to do? His brother was coming to kill him, he thought. Deliver me, I pray thee, for the hand of my brother from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. He says, he's going to come and take everything. Jacob, didn't you remember what God promised you? Well, sometimes those circumstances can overwhelm the promises of God. Sometimes the things around us, listen, don't feel bad if sometimes you forget the things that God has said because of things happening around you. This is, we're human, just like Jacob was. Okay, but God has a purpose for all this. He confesses his helplessness. He confesses his fear. It's okay to say, God, I'm afraid. He's not going to smack you over, over the head for that. It's okay. He goes on and he says this. And now says, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Again, he's reminding God, you remember what you told me? You remember what you said to me? I remember. That place called Bethel, you promised me that. And I, I set a pillar up to remind me. Look at verse 13. And he lodged there that same night and took of that which came to his hand a present for Esau, his brother. Now, Jacob figures, here's what I'll do. If I give him a lot of stuff, maybe I'll like pay him back for what I took from him. I stole the blessing. Uh, I, I bought the birthright off of him for a bowl of soup. Maybe if I start giving him stuff, it'll be like a repayment. So it says, it lists all the stuff he sent to him. 200 she-goats and 20 he-goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 milk camels with their colts, 40 kine and 10 bulls, 20 she-asses and 10 foals. And he delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by themselves, and said unto his servants, Pass over before me, and put a space betwixt drove and drove. And he commanded the foremost, saying, When Esau, my brother, meets thee, and asks thee, saying, Who are you? And where are you going? And whose are these before thee? Then you shall say, They be thy servant Jacob's. It is a present sent unto my lord Esau. And behold, also he is behind us. And so commanded he the second and the third, and all that followed the drove, saying, On this manner shall you speak unto Esau when you find him. And you say, uh, Moreover, behold, thy servant Jacob. Again, he's, he's portraying himself as Esau's servant when it should be the other way around. Behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me, and afterward I will see his face peradventure he will accept of me. Jacob said, if I give him enough stuff, maybe he'll lighten up. He didn't realize that God had already taken care of the problem. He 
didn't have to send them anything. And sometimes we try to fix the problem. And you know, we do things, and we go out of our way, and we do things, and we struggle, and we, and, and we find out we never had to do any of it. Because God had already taken care of it. So went the present over before him, and himself lodged that night in the company. Now, it seems as though Jacob was almost willing to relinquish his place as the holder of the blessing and birthright. It's almost like he wanted to give it back to save his life. Okay, now read on. Verse 30, uh, 22. And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the fort Jabbok. Uh, I read somewhere that word Jabbok means emptying. That's what that word means. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone. He's just one step away from, from princehood. He's been through the 20 years with Laban. He's come face to face with his sin. He's had to struggle and deal with all this stuff. But he's just, he has one more step going from Jacob to Israel. Going from the con man to a prince of God. One more step. And it can only happen alone. Listen, when it comes right down to it, your, your step to the next level, wherever it might be, is between you and God and nobody else. Good to come together in the house of the Lord and fellowship and good to assemble ourselves together and hear the word and pray together and get together with men and women and, and do those things. That's wonderful. But when it comes right down to it, your battle is yours and no one else's. Nobody could, nobody could deal with this battle with Jacob. He was alone. He sent all his stuff, his family, his good, all his stuff is across the brook and he's there all by himself. And it says, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. See, saints, beloved, Christians, brothers and sisters, if you haven't had a wrestling match with God yet, it's coming. Somewhere down the line, on your, on your journey from what you used to be with, to what God is going to make you, you've you got a wrestling match with God waiting. You might be saved 50 years or 20 minutes. You have an encounter waiting with God. And it's just you and him. Nobody can walk it with you. Nobody can be there. You don't, you don't get a, you know, a cheerleaders. You don't get a peanut gallery saying, go. There was a man that wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Here is Jacob. For all that he knew, it might have been his last night on earth. He didn't know the end of the story. He was facing the threat of his life. He was about to encounter Esau, the one from, uh, the, the, from whom he wrested the birthright. And now he's wrestling with a man all night long. We don't know who started the fight. We don't know where this man came from, from what direction. doesn't tell us that. But we know they wrestled. They wrestled. Verse 25. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And, out of, uh, and Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. As, as Jacob wrestled with this man, Jacob was winning the wrestling man. We're going to find out he wasn't winning because he was stronger. He persisted. He prevailed. And this man that he wrestled with touched the hollow of his thigh and put it out of joint. Verse 26. And he said, the man said, let me go for the day breaks. And Jacob said, I won't let you go 
until you bless me. Listen, listen to this wrestling match. What, when, when you're in a wrestling match with God, you need to learn to hold on to him until he blesses you. Now, look at the blessing. The gift that Jacob received. The man asked him, what's your name? Now, we know he knew what his name was. See, I, I always love it when God asks somebody a question. Like, you know, Adam, where are you? Well, he knew where Adam was. You know, he asked Jacob, what's your name? Well, he knew his name. He gave it to him. But God wants us to, to say, he wants to hear from our mouths. What's your name? He says, my name's Jacob. That name means trickster, con man, somebody who will trip somebody up. That's what they named him. Because when he was born, he was holding on to his brother's heel. So, you know, when it's, if, if somebody's walking past you, go out and grab their heel, you can trip them up. That's, that's why they gave Jacob the name they gave him. God knew his name. He wanted to hear Jacob say his name. What's your name? Jacob. And here God goes changing people's names. I love it when God changes names. Remember Abram? He changed it to Abraham. Sarai to Sarah. Our names are our identities. Who we are. Somebody calls your name. Say, that's me. I think of when uh, Nebuchadnezzar took the, took the young Hebrew children to Babylon. He tried to change their names. He tried to change their names from names exalting the Most High God to names exalting His God. He tried to change their identity. I think, I, I'm thankful when God changes our identity. When God changes who we are. When we have faith and trust in the blood of Jesus Christ, He gives us a new name. He gives us a new song. He makes us new creatures. Jacob, after 20 years of struggling with Laban and wrestling with him for 20 years over sheep and wives and kids, now wrestles with his creator. And he said, your name shall no more be Jacob, but Israel. There's a number of different ways you can translate that name, Israel. Some translate it as God rules, or God, or God prevails, some translated as a prince of God, a ruler of God. Jacob went from being a con man to a prince of God. Where has God taken you? How has he changed your name? What was your name before you knew him? What did they call you? Uh, you're, you, you're, our names haven't changed. I'm Carmen, and I've been since, you know, my parents. One time, one time somebody asked me, where did you get a name like Carmen? I said, my parents gave it to me. <laughs> it's, you know, where parents gave me a name, we have a name. But, but what I used to be, they used to call me different things. I'm sure that they had a lot of, they had a lot of names for Jacob. But now, God says, no, there's a different name now. You're a different person now. You're going from being a con man, trickster, supplanter, to a prince of God. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and has prevailed. So he blessed them. How did God bless them? He gave them a new name, and he gave them a limp. I say, that's not much of a blessing, having a limp for the rest of your life. When somebody said, and I don't know who it was, he says, beware of any leader that does not walk with a limp. And we're not talking about an actual literal limp, but for the rest of his life, Jacob had to walk with a cane. He had to, he had to lean upon a cane to, to keep himself upright for the rest of his life. You know, God will bless you with a new name, but then he'll give you a dependence upon him. 
Most Christians I know got some kind of stick they got to lean on. Especially people that get in, in a leadership or people that want to be, you know, teachers or preachers or whatever. They got some kind of stick they got to lean on. Because God is never going to let his children think that they've arrived and they're able to do everything without him. Thank God for that limp. Thank God for the limp that God put upon Jacob. You ever think about your limp? We all we all have it. We all we all have it. Everybody has. If you if you're a child of God, you have a limp somewhere. There's something that God is going to use to keep you on your face before Him, crying out to Him. Verse 29, Jacob asked the man and said, What's your name? Told you mine. I think Jacob knew what his name was. Jacob knew who he was. He knew who he was. He seen him in a dream. He had his angels come. He prayed to him. He heard his voice. But now he was face to face with God. See, this Christian thing, it's, it's no different in Genesis as, as it is right now. This Christian thing is about getting face to face in God's face and His face in yours. One on one. How can people think? Call themselves, I, I don't know, people go to church, people go to church for years and years and years and have never taken the time to get face to face with God. Maybe they're afraid of it. Some folks sit in church and they listen to the word over and over and over again and never change, never see nothing change. But if you get face to face with God, something's going to change. You can't have an encounter with God and have, have not have some kind of change. With Jacob, it took over 20 years. Some of us might take a little longer. I don't know who your Laban is. <laughs> Jacob asked him and said, what's your name? And he said, wherefore is it that thou dost ask my name? And he blessed him. You know who I am. God knew what, he knew what Jacob's name was, and Jacob knew who he was talking to. If you read through the Bible, the Old Testament, when people had an encounter, and I don't mean just a, a flighty kind of, but I mean a true, real, how many people have, have you ever had an encounter with God? Most of the times, our encounters with God comes right before we think we're going to get killed. Just like with Jacob. He was on the edge of losing everything. Jacob, in verse 30, called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. From con man to prince of God. All that stuff happened for the purpose. Everything that happened in those 20 years when Jacob was with Laban was all getting, this was the culmination. That face to face meeting on the night when Jacob thought he might never see another sunrise. That face-to-face -face meeting with God, when God said, listen, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to give you a new name, I'm going to give you a limp, and I'll always be your God, and you'll always be my son. And you'll be a prince of God. I think of, you know, I miss my brother Dave Benrix, he's coming, he sings that song, No More Death, No More Sorrow. And God shall wipe away all tears from our eyes, and we shall be his people, and he will be our God. Our God. We, we take that so lightly. I get, I get, sometimes I get so tired of hearing, you know, modern vernacular. Oh my God, oh my God. Oh my God. And they don't even know who God is. They don't know what they're saying. Verse 31. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him and he hauled it upon his thigh. He started limping. And for all his life he limped. 
Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which, which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh and the sinew. He got a limp, he got a new name, he got a limp, and now here he is on his way to meet his brother Esau. The one that he thought was going to kill him, the one who had promised to kill him. He knew in his mind, he knew what the outcome was going to be. He had it all, uh, he, 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 he had everything set up. Look what he did. Verse 1 of uh, 33. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. Here, here it is. Here's the showdown. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids. And he put the handmaids and their children foremost. Interesting that you can tell who, what Jacob's uh, uh, you know, priorities were. The handmaids went first, then Leah, and then Rachel, because Rachel and Joseph were his, were his special ones, you know. And when we start reading about the children, we're, we're going to see that. He put them, you know, he put them second just in case, you know, they, they might be able to run. And he passed over before them. He went first and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. Jacob. All that, all that fear all that anxiety, all that stuff that you pushed over there thinking you can buy peace with your brother when God had it all taken care of. He had it all worked out before it ever happened. And all for the purpose of why? To take this man named Jacob, this con man, and take him to a place where they could call him Prince of God. What will God do? If he did that for Jacob, what will he do for you and for me? He wants to bring us to a place where we can be called princes and princesses of God. Where we can say that we, we rule with God. That we, that we have authority with God. He wants to bring us to that place. It doesn't just happen like that. Some folks think you get saved and you're ready to start casting devils out of things. You've got to go through the Laban experience. You've got to go through the penal. You've got to get face to face with God. If you want God to use you in, 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 with some, in, in some capacity, you need to get face to face with him. You need to get a limp. The Apostle Paul, when he talked about being caught up to the third heaven, you remember that? Over in first, uh, Second Corinthians. Well, let's just read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Okay. Uh, the Apostle Paul, who was given revelation of the mysteries of God above anybody else, he said, it is not expedient for me, in, in chapter 12 and verse 1 of 2 Corinthians, it is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. You know, in this, in this letter, the Second Corinthians, Paul spends a lot of time defending his ministry against those who would try to uh, tarnish his reputation. And he says, I've had visions, I've had revelations. He says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knows. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. Now I'm going to say something. And I don't want anybody to get mad at me. You can get mad at me if you want to. But you know, I, I, I've, I've read some and heard some books of people that say they've gone to heaven and they come back and they write a book. Now, I'm not going to I'm not going to stand judgment that people write them kind of books. I, I don't know, you know. But in the Bible, there's only one guy I know of that actually that actually went there. He was caught up in the third heaven. I believe what Paul says. I don't believe anybody else could ever say that it was caught up and come back. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm missing something. But he says, I, I was caught up in the third heaven, uh, in verse 3, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Paul says, I'm not sure if I was in the flesh or if I was dead or I, I'm not sure how this happened. How that he was caught up into paradise 
and heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter. Paul went up there and he, he said it wasn't even lawful for him to write nothing down about it. So, okay. I'm not. He says, of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I'd like to, you know, stand up and pound myself on the chest and say, man, God brought me up into his presence in the third heaven. He says, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he sees me to be, or that he hears me. Now listen what he says. And lest I should be exalted, Paul, the apostle, write two-thirds of the New Testament, uh, plant churches all through Asia and Europe. Paul, the apostle, lifted up as being one of the greatest men of God, and, and uh, uh, the, 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 he gives us the doctrines of the church. I mean, he was given this great revelation. He said, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Now, if you pray for God for revelation, you better get ready for the, for the rest of this story. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. A lamp. We don't know what this thorn was. We don't know what it was. We don't know if it was a person. We don't know if it was an ailment. We don't know what it was. He doesn't tell us. And I believe he doesn't tell us because every one of us has a thorn. And yours probably wasn't the same as his is. But there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan sent to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. God made sure that I was not going to allow myself to get a big head over what he had shown me. You know, I, I, and again, we live in a time of mass media, and we see preachers and teachers and and so forth, and stand up, and they prophets, and prophets, and this and that. You know, show me your limp. If you're going to stand up and preach God's word, or prophesy, or say these things, show me where, show me where the thorn is. Because all through this word, anybody that God ever used, in that kind of capacity, usually, had to go through a Laban experience, had to walk around with a limp, had to live with a thorn. Listen to what Paul says. He says, For this thing I besought the Lord three times. God, take this away from me. And what did Jesus say? We know it by heart. He said, My grace is sufficient for you. Why? For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. If you walk with that limp like Jacob had to, there's just all the more opportunity for the strength of God to be your crutch. So from, from con man to a prince of God, what did it take? 20 years, servitude, fleeing, running for his life twice, coming face to face with somebody that had sworn to kill him, only to realize God had it all lined up from the very beginning. If you go on and read the story in Genesis, and we're going to close. Esau invited him. He said, come on and settle down with me. Let's. And Jacob said, no thanks. We're going to go over this way because we have flocks and so forth. And we're going to go over here. And as we go on in the study of Genesis, again, the, the emphasis comes away from Jacob. And we're going to start looking at the kids. In all the kids. <laughs> the kids. There's some stories in there about them kids. They probably gave Jacob a lot of gray hair. Yeah. Anybody here give their parents gray hair? I gave my dad a few gray hair. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. But you know what? I thank God. I'm thankful, and I'm closing. I'm thankful my father lived long enough to see me go from a con man to a prince of God. I mean, he, he saw the transformation. My dad, I, I just, when I got saved, I, I probably told the story a million times. When I got saved, and, and, and uh, I didn't tell anybody. I just, I was kind of, I didn't tell anybody. And my dad asked me one time, he said, what got into you? What's wrong with you? I said, Dad, I got saved. He scratched his head because he was Catholic, you know, they were Catholic. He scratched his head and said, well, what do you mean? He said, where are you going to church? He said, well, I'm going to the Church of God over in Trenton. He said, 
So he was like really, and my co- I didn't realize that my cousin told me he was crushed. When I, he, he realized I wasn't going back to Catholic Church. He thought I joined the cult. He did. He thought I was going to be shaving my head and banging tambourines on street corners somewhere. I don't know. But when he, after, after time, and he saw the change. You see, it, it didn't happen overnight. But when he saw the change, he realized that this was God. Why? Well, God, God had given me a few limbs. How many people here got a limp? Got a limp? 